Chicago is a city that's always been known for its high-rise buildings. These skyscrapers have achieved something like mythological status. And any time I see buildings that have achieved the level of myth, I think it's always worth kind of cracking those open and seeing if we can figure out whether they live up to the myth or at the very least what really happened. There are three sort of big myths about Chicago skyscrapers that I think are worth digging into because the truth actually is genuinely more interesting than the, than the mythology sort of lets on. Um, one of the most uh, engaging for architectural historians is the idea that Chicago had these architects and engineers who had this very pure approach that was somehow contaminated or diluted by the impact of mercantile classicism, the style that was allegedly uh, imported or forced upon Chicago by New York architects after the, the Columbian Exposition of 1892. There are equally uh, sort of uh, sticky myths about the Chicago school being the exponent of the form follows function, this idea that they were somehow proto-modern uh, in a way, and that the 19th century skyscrapers especially foretold the modern movement uh, through Louis Sullivan's well-known aphorism. And finally, the myth that a lot of us grew up on is that the skyscraper was somehow invented in Chicago. And in particular, this one building by uh, William LeBaron Jenny, architect and engineer, the Home Insurance Building, was somehow the first skyscraper, the, the invention, the, the original uh, of, of, the, of the type. What I've tried to argue in my research and uh, in, in my book on early Chicago skyscrapers is that, in fact, Chicago represents a very specific case of evolutionary pressures, that the skyscrapers that emerged in the city were the results of negotiations between what clients uh, wanted, what the city wanted, and what materials and techniques were actually available. Uh, aesthetic preferences, of course, played a role. Architects, clients, uh, builders all want their buildings to look good. But the styles of the buildings and uh, basically the way they looked came after all of these forces that impacted what the buildings really were, how the buildings really arose uh, on their sites. The easiest of these myths to knock down is this idea that the Chicago school uh, was somehow contaminated by uh, New York civic classicism or mercantile classicism. And the easiest way to do that is to just look at the chronology. The Chicago school we often think of as sort of Louis Sullivan, Carson Perry Scott being maybe the, the ultimate uh, example of this. The Columbian Exposition, so the story goes, came about because Chicago sort of lost its nerve when it gets this huge World's Fair. Uh, and instead of hiring its own, it hires McKim, Mead and White and all of these classical architects from New York. And then somehow the city loses its way and its architects go on to design these very beautiful, uh, but somehow less honest or less pure structures uh, than those of the Chicago school. And this myth is easy to dismantle in a couple of ways. First of all, McKim, Mead and White weren't the only architects working on the Columbian Exposition. William LeBaron, Jenny, and even Louis Sullivan contributed buildings to the so-called White City. Uh, but beyond that, just the chronology doesn't hold up. Louis Sullivan's Carson's building was built in 1902, the, the uh, kind of archetype of the, of the Chicago school. School. That was 10 years after the Columbian Exposition of 1892. And the buildings that we often associate with this kind of contaminating influence didn't come until much later, the 19 teens and even the 1920s. The, the Wrigley Building may be the ultimate example uh, that historians have pointed to of the influence of uh, the Columbian Exposition's White City ideal was a full 30 years, an entire generation after the Columbian Exposition. So the, the myth of the, the kind of lost cause of the Chicago school doesn't really hold water. The other uh, mythology that I think architectural historians are much more fond of is this idea that the Chicago school was this sort of purist uh, movement that foretold the functionalism, uh, the kind of rigid functionalism of, of the modern movement. And while it is perfectly true that Louis Sullivan's three-word aphorism, form follows function, was profoundly influential in the way that architects thought about their work in the 20th century, it's not totally the case that the Chicago School uh, followed functionalism so closely. 
And if we look at the skyscrapers, this to me is the, is the ultimate uh, kind of example of just how complex uh, the, the, the story really is. Uh, the skyscraper is uh, probably the simplest function in the world. It's, it involves just taking the plot of land that you have and multiplying it as many times as you can legally, safely, and structurally. So the building that I think of is Chicago's kind of origin skyscraper, the 10-story Montauk block from 1883 and say the Sears Tower from 1974, not quite 100 years later, uh, both of these have exactly the same function. They are, in the words of Minneapolis architect Cass Gilbert, machines for making the land pay. They are kind of architectural leverage on the resources we have to buy a plot of land and to build on top of it and to turn that into rentable area. The function of the Montauk block, the function of the Sears Tower is exactly the same. And if Sullivan's aphorism was right, they should look the same. Of course they don't. And interestingly enough, Sullivan's business partner, Dankmar Adler, engineer, had a repost to Sullivan's aphorism. Uh, later in 1896, Adler addressing the American Institute of Architects annual convention gently took Sullivan to task. And he said that while there was some truth to the matter, right, buildings do kind of shape themselves in part based on what their function is. Um, this isn't a direct relationship. Form doesn't follow function in a straight line. The materials of which buildings are erected, Adler said, always affect the designs. And what changed between the time of the Montauk and the time of Sears? Well, it wasn't a change in the desire of developers to build as many floors as they could. What it was instead was there was a different palette of materials, high strength steel instead of brick, uh, plate glass, double insulated plate glass instead of single, single layer cylinder glass, uh, deep caisson foundations instead of uh, floating stone pyramid foundations. All of these techniques and materials are the things that I think shaped the skyscraper, made it an evolutionary process that went from 10-story brick buildings in 1885 to 30- and 40-story steel buildings in the 20s and 30s and to 100-story steel and concrete buildings in the late 20th century. The third myth that I want to uh, explode a little bit is this idea of the first skyscraper. It's very common to hear that William LeBaron Jenny uh, invented the skyscraper with uh, this example, the home insurance building in Chicago, that he had recalled a birdcage he'd seen on a, on a youthful voyage to the Philippines and came up with this idea of the skeleton frame uh, sort of all of a sudden. This is a much longer uh, story. This is a more difficult myth to bust simply. But what it involves is looking at the evolutionary history of the Chicago skyscraper, seeing where the home insurance fits into that evolutionary history, critiquing it based on both where it stood uh, in relation to the technology of its time and where it stood in relation to uh, innovations that came afterward and realizing that while it's a very illustrative example of the way technology and architecture merged together uh, in the 1880s, it's just one of many steps on the way to what we consider today uh, the modern skyscraper. So those three myths I want to keep in the back of our mind as we sort of explore this story. Uh, and I want to look, first of all, at why Chicago was such a laboratory for tall building construction. What was it about this city uh, that made it the place where so many of these innovations took place, uh, where so much thought was given to how to uh, more efficiently, more effectively, more safely build floor upon floor upon floor? The geography of Chicago was, in a way, its destiny. Uh, sitting uh, on the shore of Lake Michigan, the small trading post that began as Fort Dearborn uh, in the 18th century, was located at the mouth of the slow-moving network of rivers, the, collectively known as the Chicago River. About 15 miles to the southwest, over a swampy portage between the headwaters of the Chicago River uh, and a low ridge, uh, lay the Des Plaines River, and beyond the Des Plaines River, the Illinois River. From a very, very early point in time, the 18th century, white European settlers began trading furs over this ridge because it connected two great waterways, the Mississippi River leading to St. Louis and New Orleans and Lake Michigan leading to the Great Lakes and eventually to Buffalo. After 1824, the Erie Canal meant that there was a link between Lake Michigan 
and the Hudson River and thus New York. And so Chicago stood at the kind of nexus of a great uh, inland waterway. Riverboats coming from the Mississippi River, from the Illinois River would have to stop, unload their cargo onto lake boats that could carry it then to Buffalo uh, and to the markets to the east. In 1848, the city uh, invested in a new canal that allowed riverboats to directly go from the Des Plaines River to downtown Chicago. But the trade still had to happen, the exchange still had to happen between river navigation and lake navigation. And Chicago became the nation's great center for exchange very quickly. People in Chicago didn't necessarily make things, they didn't necessarily grow things, but they held on to things. They warehoused things, they traded things, they bet on the future prices of things, and they made their money essentially by being this nexus in the nation's great inland waterway uh, trade route. Between 1850 and 1890, Chicago found itself fortuitously at the center of another vast trade network. Being at the southern end of Lake Michigan, all of the agricultural wealth that was newly accessible by uh, the nation's railroad system had to pass through the city, had to go around the southern end of Lake Michigan. One network of railways built its way from New York and Boston and Philadelphia west to Chicago. A second set of railways built itself west from Chicago to the Great Plains, to Iowa, to Minnesota, the Dakotas, even as far west uh, as Denver and Colorado. William Cronin has shown that this gray area about the size of Western Europe was in fact Chicago's economic hinterland, that all of the wealth of this vast area, this vast newly settled area by Europeans uh, funneled its way through Chicago. And again, Chicago warehoused the grain, exchanged the grain, took it off of rail cars, loaded it onto lake boats, uh, and very soon a, a speculative class grew up. Investors who would bet on the future prices of grain, on what they could sell grain uh, for to the East Coast markets versus what they could buy it from, uh, from the, the inner uh, agricultural markets of, of the Midwest. That manifested itself in a couple of ways. Alongside the Chicago River, the so-called iron necklace uh, of rails, the Illinois Central coming from uh, Southern Illinois and Central Illinois, the Rock Island and the Chicago, Burlington and Quincy coming from Iowa and eventually Nebraska, and the Northwestern Railways coming from Minnesota all converged on the loop. And all of them interfaced with the Chicago River, uh, leading to great lumber yards, towering grain elevators. Uh, if you look at the, the kind of shores of the Chicago River, it is teeming with warehouses, elevators, wharves, places where uh, material would be taken off of uh, rail cars or river boats and put onto lake shipping to head east. In the center of what today we call the loop, a different sort of architecture grew up. Instead of the uh, warehouses and the wharves and the storage facilities uh, alongside the river, uh, new real estate ventures involving offices for people making money off of that speculation sprung up. And eventually Chicago real estate became its own commodity. Uh, people investing in or betting on uh, the price of grain in Nebraska needed a place to do business. As more and more of them came to make or lose fortunes on the price of grain in Nebraska, they needed proximity, they needed places to do business. And with the loop hemmed in by the river, hemmed in by this iron necklace, Chicago real estate became a commodity that people traded in just as they traded in wheat or corn or grain futures. Over time, the need or the desire to build taller, to build floor upon floor upon floor, uh, took advantage of innovations that largely came first from New York. The 1850s, Elisha Otis's safety break meant that for the first time, floors uh, above the fourth or fifth story could be reached easily and safely. Uh, and so you begin to see real estate ventures, commercial real estate, going beyond those four or five floors, reaching six, maybe seven, sometimes eight stories. But builders were still limited by the palette of structural materials they had. And we don't see a big jump beyond that six or seven stories in the 1850s. We see it later in the 1870s.
The structural technology behind these early buildings was largely derived from English mill construction, using cast iron columns and wrought iron beams uh, to achieve a, a level of uh, stability and stiffness in tall buildings, tall buildings up to six or seven stories. Mills required heavy brick walls around the outside, both for fireproofing, but also for lateral stability. Cast iron and wrought iron didn't allow the sort of stiff connections that we're used to today. And so these metal frames, even though they were very efficient against gravity loads, really required help in terms of their lateral resistance, their ability to resist uh, loads like a uh, wind coming from the side of a building. Cast iron was widely used in Chicago. Uh, it was uh, used to get up to those six or seven stories. And uh, speculators, real estate developers, took advantage of the fact that cast iron took up much less floor space uh, than brick. It was much more efficient spatially. They didn't have to waste as much of the building volume uh, with structure. They could uh, make the structure much smaller and make money off of the resulting uh, increase in floor area uh, around the columns. Cast iron, though, had a major problem, which is that despite being sold as a fireproof material, it actually performed very poorly in building fires. Uh, here in the photograph of the wreckage after the 1871 fire in Chicago, in the front you can see the remains of a cast iron uh, building. Cast iron is made, of course, by melting iron, pouring it into molds, and so it's susceptible to heat. If you reheat a cast iron element, it softens and eventually melts. Even worse, it's brittle and it's thermally unstable. So when firefighters would come in and quench a fire in a cast iron building, the red hot cast iron would get doused with cold water uh, and it would shatter. And when columns shatter, uh, all of the floors and things that they hold up, of course, uh, come down on, on the occupants. The entire business district of Chicago, timber structures, cast iron structures, the few brick structures that there were, uh, were destroyed, of course, in October 1871. And the city learned a valuable lesson, not only about the need to uh, build fireproof buildings, uh, but also about the limitations of cast iron. It wasn't until later fires in 1874 in particular that the city began to pass fire ordinances. But when they did, they sort of preferenced uh, brick construction, particularly in the downtown area. And beginning in the late 1870s, uh, Chicago being on the shores of a, a slow moving river with abundant clay soil uh, produced bricks uh, as much as any other city in North America. The brickmaking industry in the United States had been located in Philadelphia. Entrepreneurs brought new pressed brick machines to Chicago in the late 1870s. And these turned out bricks that were made of clay that had all of the water hydraulically squeezed out of them before firing. And this increased their strength by two or three times. We see the effects of this almost immediately. That Montauk block, uh, built in 1882, 1883, used press brick technology to become the first building in Chicago to reach 10 stories. And you can see, looking at the floor plan, that even though there are three or four cast iron columns, the vast majority of the Montauk block is held up by these brick walls that intersect uh, the interior and that wrap around the exterior. If you look at the facade, though, you can see that height wasn't the only problem uh, on the minds of Chicago's architects and builders. The facade of the Montauk block can really be read as the brick piers uh, that are holding the building up and the windows that are illuminating the offices within, almost sort of fighting for space on the building facade. And in fact, the problem of lighting uh, was absolute. It was one of the determining factors in the forms of buildings in the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, John Wellborn Root, Burnham's partner, uh, co-designer of the, of the Montauk, wrote in 1890 about the quote-unquote great architectural problem of the skyscraper. And to Root, that great architectural problem was not height, but it was daylighting. Electricity was available, but it was incredibly expensive. Furthermore, the uh, light bulbs, the, the lamps that were used uh, to illuminate office interiors were very short-lived. They had lives with carbon filaments of uh, a couple hundred hours, meaning that they were only used during nighttime hours or during really inclement weather. During the day, offices had to be illuminated by daylight. 
And Root's lecture goes through the elaborate design options that he and Burnham would use to design a building both uh, to take advantage of light from the street side and also to wrap it around interior light courts that would provide illumination from the interior. Root also went out of his way to talk about the building facade and problems like the facade of the Montauk, where structure and illumination competed for space on the building facades. Iron was, of course, one of the great ways not only to save floor space, but also to uh, save facade space, to limit the size of the structure on the facade to maximize uh, the size of windows. Cast iron wasn't as popular in Chicago as it had been in New York in the 1850s and 1860s, but we do see it. We see it in some surviving cast iron fronts uh, in the loop. On the left, the Berghoff restaurant, a cast iron front imported uh, from manufacturers in New York. And you can see that the brick piers are, have been replaced by very, very skinny cast iron uh, columns. And on the right, retrofits done in the 1880s to uh, late 1870s facades uh, on, um, uh, around the corner uh, on Lake Street and Wells, where the lower stories, uh, the lower story, the, the retail story on the bottom, the brick has been stripped out and replaced by cast iron columns uh, and cast iron girders that carry the rest of the brick facade above them. You can see by comparing the size of the brick on the second, third, and fourth story with the size of the columns on the first story that cast iron's uh, greater compressive strength allows it to carry the same load with much less area. And while in British mills, uh, the owners discovered that they could squeeze more floor area out of their buildings with cast iron. With cast iron fronts, builders realized that they could uh, open up larger windows uh, with cast iron as a structural material, bringing in more daylight while increasing the internal uh, efficiency uh, of their buildings. The fireproofing problem was solved in part by another clay technology. So pressed brick is one that, that takes advantage of the, the material that's literally under Chicago's feet. Um, terracotta fireproofing is another native uh, industry that, sh that grows up in Chicago that creates pieces out of lightweight clay, terracotta, that can be shaped around iron structures. So columns or, uh, in these cases, beams, uh, insulating material that prevents the, the, um, the, the heat of a building fire from getting to the sensitive or delicate iron in the middle that wraps around it, insulates it, and protects it from, from that heat uh, and flame. Terracotta was built, was uh, manufactured in ways that it could wrap around joists and girders uh, and also columns. And these hybrid structures of uh, iron structure with clay uh, terracotta fireproofing became the standard in the 1870s and 1880s. Now, the clay that was very good for brick, for terracotta fireproofing, uh, unfortunately proved to be really terrible for foundations. And uh, here in the 1890s, the New York Times talking about the Chicago very proud of itself for uh, its rebirth after the fire. And the New York Times basically saying, it doesn't really matter, Chicago can build all at once. It's on this very, very thick layer of water saturated clay, right next to a slow moving river that's been depositing clay for hundreds of thousands of years and next to a lake that keeps that clay saturated. And it refers to uh, Chicago's soil uh, as a great layer of jelly in Chicago's cake. It is true, the city has some of the worst soil for tall building construction on the planet, but this forced Chicago builders to be innovative, to think of ways that they could both lighten the, the weight of their building, cast iron certainly helped with this, but also how they could literally float their buildings uh, on this terrible foundation soil that underlays Chicago's loop. A comparison here with other cities on the East Coast is really instructive. Uh, bedrock in New York City and Boston is often much closer to the surface uh, than it is in Chicago. In lower Manhattan, uh, it's just a few feet below the, the, the surface. And therefore, building structures can literally rest directly on bedrock. Builders in New York and Boston were used to simply taking the walls of their building down a few extra feet, providing a little bit of a spread footing to, to balance the wall a little bit and being done with it. The granite that underlay Lower Manhattan, that underlay Boston, uh, was sufficient to build buildings of 17, 20, 25 stories very, very easily. 
In Chicago, that layer of bedrock is down something like 80 or 100 feet. And in the mid-19th century, there was no way of reaching it successfully uh, with, with foundations. Instead, Chicago engineers gradually developed ways to literally float their buildings on this layer of soil. Up through the early 1880s, they used what were called pyramidal footings, uh, where each column or pier would come down onto a pyramid of stone. And that pyramid would spread out until the engineers were confident that it could float the load of the column coming down and sitting on it uh, adequately. After 1882, engineers began using surplus railroad iron uh, for what were called grillage footings, uh, giant kind of lily pads of iron uh, that could float uh, the, the building successfully uh, without taking up all of the space or adding all of the weight uh, that pyramidal footings did. Now, this, I think, influenced the way Chicago architects thought about their building structures. If you're bringing your building down onto just a simple spread footing on bedrock, you have no reason to think of it as anything other than a wall. That wall can sit directly on the rock with a little spread footing. It'll be stable. In Chicago, though, there was no way of knowing really how that wall was going to behave when you floated it over a large area of soil. Engineers were worried about differential settlement. They were worried about how to calculate the, the way that a wall would spread its load out over such a long, linear uh, bit of soil. And so instead, the advice became to distill the building structure down into piers, uh, into individual columns, and to think about the building foundations as what were called isolated piers or isolated foundations. It was much easier to calculate the load of a single column than it was to calculate the load of the entire exterior wall. And the logic initially behind the pyramidal foundations was to isolate each one of the columns to calculate its tributary area, to estimate its weight, and then to take the bearing capacity of this very, very poor soil and use that to determine the area that you would need to spread that weight out over. When grillage foundations came along, I think you can begin to see the foundations influencing the superstructure of buildings in that here we have isolated foundations that begin to look more and more like the skinny, uh, very, very honed structures that we think of as a skeleton frame. Steel columns or iron columns coming down and sitting on steel or iron grillages. Each one of these now looks less like a pier and more like a column, like a skeletal element in a framework or a grid uh, of other steel uh, structural pieces. You can see some of this influence in the early so-called skeleton frames. And this goes back as far as 1879 when William LeBaron Jenny uh, designed a store, a warehouse for the lighter family, uh, merchants uh, who needed a warehouse in the loop. Jenny used cast iron. You can see the black dots in the plan uh, and brick. Brick on the exterior. Here you see the, the brick piers. Each one of the brick piers on this side has a cast iron column behind it. And the building really worked by taking the internal loads and putting them onto the cast iron, taking the weight of the exterior wall and putting it onto the brick. And you can see the effect. The windows in the lighter store uh, are much, much bigger than you would get in a solid bearing brick wall like the Montauk. And you can also see that Jenny is maybe thinking of the foundation as the generator now for a very, very rigorous grid of isolated cast iron columns that each come down and sit on their own sort of lily pad foundation uh, underneath. Large windows, skeletal iron elements, uh, a, a structural grid or network of beams and girders and columns. This becomes the kind of signature of the so-called Chicago School. The grids that the city's engineers and architects develop are very, very different from the wall-based structures uh, that are occurring out east in cities where the foundations uh, are much, much easier uh, to, to, or much more reliable than they are in Chicago. Another example of this is Burnham and Root's Rookery Building in 1885, where uh, the structure is distilled down into a network of brick piers on the outside, each of which sit on a grillage foundation, uh, and cast iron columns on the interior. Now, the Rookery is one of the first buildings to be tall enough that, in this case, Burnham and Root are worried about the effects of wind on a 10-story building. And what they do in conjunction with 
uh, their engineer is they think of the rookery basically uh, as a giant brick wall on the outside that's distilled down into individual piers. Uh, that brick on the exterior provides enough lateral stability. Uh, you can see that it's long in the north, south, and east, west directions. The brick wall provides enough lateral stability to keep the building up. On the inside, much like British mill construction, the rookery is composed of cast iron columns uh, and wrought iron beams. But it's the, the brick on the outside that's now doing the work of stabilizing the building in addition to doing some of the work of holding the building up. On the interior, though, you get a glimpse of what building facades could be uh, if that brick could disappear. The courtyard, the light court of the rookery, uh, was designed without the sort of Richardsonian Romanesque pretensions that, that Root has on the exterior of the building. Uh, and instead, the interior, the courtyard side of the, of the rookery, is literally just cast iron columns that are clad with the lightest possible terracotta covers, the shortest possible terracotta spandrels, so that the windows off of that light court can be maximized. They can be as large as possible. This is often referred to as a sort of proto-curtain wall, getting close to the idea that we're taking uh, the functions of the brick wall away entirely. The gravity load is being taken up by the cast iron columns. The wind load is being taken up by that set of external brick piers. Here we have for the first time what a building facade might look like uh, if we took away all of its uh, structural uh, re responsibilities. Now, part of the reason that engineers and architects are still reliant on brick is that they're still building with cast and wrought iron in the 1880s. And while these are very, very good materials in some ways, they have a fundamental flaw in the way they get put together. Uh, cast iron produced by taking very, very high carbon iron, literally melting it, pouring it into molds, has a very, very high compressive strength, relatively weak tensile strength. And that's largely because cast iron is an incredibly brittle material and it's unreliable in both bending uh, and tension. Bubbles of air get entrained during the pouring process. Uh, the material becomes very brittle after it cools uh, and cast iron beams had a tendency to snap, to, to break uh, under load. So not terribly reliable uh, in tension or in bending. Wrought iron, on the other hand, was manufactured by literally pounding the carbon out of red hot iron deposits. It could then be rolled into relatively thin shapes. The resulting material was ductile because of its low carbon content, but relatively weak compared with cast iron. It had, however, reliable tensile strength. And so wrought iron was typically used for beams where you experience compression and tension, uh, and cast iron was typically used for columns, which are usually just in compression. Wrought iron, though, was ductile. It could be worked. It could be drilled. It could be cut after uh, it came off of the rollers. Cast iron, when it came out of the mold, you had what you had. There was no way to work it without risking uh, shattering the, the column or whatever it was that you were bringing out of the mold. This down here is a little bit uh, of a spoiler alert, right? Steel becomes the material that splits the difference essentially between cast and wrought iron. But just for the moment, to go back to how buildings were built with the iron materials instead of steel, if you think about cast iron as a material that uh, can't be drilled or cut, there's no good way to connect to it. And here, uh, a, a, a piece of cast and wrought iron salvaged from the home insurance building uh, when it was wrecked in the 1930s. You can see the very, very thin, uh, malleable edges of the wrought iron beams and girders contrasted with the very kind of thick, crude proportions of the cast iron column. All of the elements on the cast iron uh, column are, uh, have to be molded, have to be stripped out of a mold, and therefore you don't get the really uh, thin, easily drillable surfaces that you do with wrought iron. Connections between cast iron and wrought iron are problematic. You can see one here that is literally a pin that's driven through holes in both the beam and the column. The hole in the column has to be oversized because you don't quite know where it's going to end up as the column cools. And so that pin is literally just linking the two together. It's not providing any stiffness. It's not providing any resistance uh, to racking or to twisting. The home insurance building, this famous supposedly first skyscraper by William LeBaron Jenny, used cast iron columns in blue. 
uh, wrought iron beams and girders in green, and then encased those elements in brick jackets that were used for fireproofing, but that also very clearly stiffened those joints that provided the lateral stability, the, the stability against wind uh, that was necessary in buildings of eight or nine or 10 stories. The home insurance building also had party walls along its west and north facades that helped stabilize the building as well. And the building's great claim is that it's supposedly the original skeleton frame. But when you go back to the drawings and if you reconstruct the building digitally, uh, which a team of grad students and I uh, did, what you find is that it is in fact a skeleton frame, but it's encased in mostly uh, a brick uh, structure, much like the rookery. The, the only difference between the home insurance and the contemporary rookery is that the home insurance's brick piers basically have cast iron reinforcement built into the, the piers themselves. And this was confirmed really when the building was wrecked uh, in the early 30s. Committee of Architectural Historians, uh, trying to prove that the building was the first skyscraper, uh, stripped one of the columns uh, of its brick. They believed that this proved that the iron itself was strong enough to hold up the brick, that the brick was essentially a sort of elaborate curtain wall. I think what it really shows, though, is that the brick and the iron were working in conjunction, that the brick adhered to the iron, right? This brick is still being held up by its adherence to that column, and therefore they must really have worked together. The home insurance, rather than being a pure iron structure, a pure skeleton structure, was really a hybrid structure. It was a reinforced masonry structure. This was pretty much confirmed by a parallel investigation by the Society of Western, Western Society of Engineers, uh, which looked at the same wreckage that the, the Talmadge Commission, the, the Commission of uh, Architectural Historians, uh, looked at, and, and basically came up with the conclusion that instead of going with what they considered modern construction, uh, curtain walls and steel wind bracing of what they called the modern skeleton building, that the home insurance too was essentially a reinforced brick structure. Now, this report is really interesting because it gives us a kind of formula for what came next. These are engineers in the 1930s, looking back about 40, 50 years at Jenny's decisions uh, in the home insurance building, and they're basically saying, well, here's what the home insurance hadn't quite done. They hadn't quite had pure curtain walls, and they hadn't had the steel wind bracing of what they call a modern skeleton building. These, in fact, are the next two developments. The curtain wall or the lightweight enclosure comes very, very rapidly. Uh, two young upstart architects named Holliburton and Roche, who would go on to become one of the city's most prolific and famous architectural firms, realize that they can take those bracing walls of the home insurance or the, the rookery, and they can basically turn them perpendicular to the exterior walls. They can take them from exterior bearing uh, and wind walls and make them internal shear walls. And their great experiment in this is the Tacoma building of 1889. And you can see that in the east-west direction, we have two very, very thick shear walls. In the north-south direction, we also have two very thick shear walls. And then between those walls, we have, a, again, a pure skeleton construction, uh, cast iron columns, wrought iron beams. Holliburton Roche used that to take the curtain wall and to make it uh, as glassy as they possibly can. The Tacoma gets criticized for being a quote unquote fragile building. Critics for the Tribune are worried that uh, this house of glass will literally topple over at the first windstorm. They worry about it because they can't see the walls that are holding the building up against wind, these massive shear walls that are now set perpendicular to the exterior wall. Again, reconstructing this, what we found is that, yes, there are in fact cast iron columns, wrought iron girders and beams, all protected by terracotta masonry, but stayed against the wind by these 24 inch thick masonry walls. That is what is holding the, what held the Tacoma up uh, against wind before it was demolished in the early 1940s. One of the two innovations that the Society of Western Engineers panel thought was necessary for the, the modern skyscraper, uh, the separation of all of the building's structural functions, gravity loads and lateral loads, and the actual skin of the building, which here I would argue is one of the very first curtain walls, lightweight, thin skins that clads uh, a self-supporting structure. 
Now, by the late 1880s, steel becomes commercially available, and Chicago is one of the first cities not only to manufacture steel for building construction, but also to put it to work. Steel, like I said, is this kind of uh, magic balance between the properties of cast iron and wrought iron. Its carbon content is somewhere between the two, and it has the unique quality of having almost precisely equal compressive and tensile strength. So it's very good for columns. It has uh, strength that is approaching, but not quite that of cast iron. And it has very, very good tensile strength. So it's good for beams and girders, uh, just like wrought iron was. You can eliminate the, the kind of two manufacturing processes. You can build the entire uh, building skeleton out of steel, since it's good in compression and good in bending. But most importantly, steel is ductile. And so if you make the columns and the girders uh, both out of the same material, you can make connections in steel that are themselves stiff that help the building frame resist the wind without so much support uh, from brick masonry uh, shear walls. Engineers very quickly take advantage of this uh, to design buildings that, re that rely on uh, principles transferred from bridge construction and ship construction. William LeBaron Jenny uses uh, cross bracing, which you see here on the top. He says that his buildings are built like bridges, uh, railroad truss bridges that instead of spanning over a river are basically sticking up out of the ground, cantilevered against the wind. Knee braces, which you see here, uh, take advantage of a technique used in naval architecture, shipbuilding, where the deck of the building is connected to the hull by a stiff kind of elbow uh, called, a, called a knee brace or a deck brace. And then finally, portal frames, which use sort of thickened uh, columns and thickened girders to create very, very deep, very strong moment joints in the corners uh, between the girder and, and the columns themselves. Now, none of these are possible in cast iron, where the joinery has to be relatively crude, holes have to be oversized, pieces kind of rattle around a little bit. But in steel, you can drill holes in these very, very thin elements. You can come back. Uh, on the job site and ream them, redrill them when they're in place so that they have very, a very, very precise fit. And then you can hammer rivets into them. You can have, hammer 20, 30, 35 rivets uh, into a joint, and you can get these sort of connections that just visually look to be as stiff as they really are. And what this means, first of all, is that you can actually build these types of bridge and ship connections that were originally only possible in wrought iron uh, trusses or wrought iron ship decks. Um, it also means that you can actually distill or take uh, all of the stiffness that goes into a cross brace building uh, and sort of shrink it down or compress it into the joints themselves. If you make every single joint in the skyscraper frame into what's called a moment connection, a very, very stiff, rigid joint, uh, a wind force will get dispersed throughout the entire frame. And you actually find that in buildings up to about 15 or 20 stories, you don't need any of these wind bracing techniques. You can actually get by with just a very, very heavy, very, very uh, stiff uh, moment joints. So here on the left, that home insurance uh, connection. Here on the right, similar connections in steel. And you can see here uh, riveted uh, elements that have been, uh, that have, the rivets have occupied holes first drilled into the elements in the shop and then reamed once uh, in place with elements next to it. And here, uh, a steel uh, I-beam or W shape. Uh, and you can imagine that these, of course, are much, much easier to drill and cut than the very, very thick, brittle cast iron elements that uh, shaped the, the, the home insurance. The first generation of these wind braced frames uh, happened for the most part on Dearborn Street, a street that is cut through uh, a regular Chicago block and thus has uh, very, very skinny lots on either side. Um, Dearborn Street is cut through to a new train station, so it becomes a very popular uh, real estate neighborhood. And what this means is that architects and engineers are not only building taller, they are building taller on skinnier lots. And these three buildings in particular, uh, the Manhattan, the Old Colony, and the Fisher, along with the Monadnock, which you see uh, further north, this is like a, a sort of laboratory for early wind bracing techniques. William LeBaron Jenny uh, stiffens the Manhattan building with a system of cross bracing, a railroad truss bridge basically turned up on its end. 
These uh, steel uh, elements are sort of hidden within the, the walls of the, of the Manhattan building. They take up almost no space. Uh, and Jenny's client is able to rent out the maximum amount of floor area because there no longer are the two foot thick shear walls that it took, for instance, to stay the, the Tacoma. Here are the old colony, which used portal frames, uh, giant steel plates that created these very, very deep corners. You can imagine uh, a, a wind, a force trying to uh, distort the frame of the old colony needs to actually bend the columns and the girders because the connections between them uh, aren't going anywhere. And again, here you see the lines of uh, wind bracing in the old colony uh, in the for a portal brace. You need to shape the ceiling to that elliptical form. That's no problem, though. That comes to be seen as, as a feature of the offices uh, with, within the old colony. It's the Monadnock, I think, that shows the transition most clearly from masonry to steel. We think of the Monadnock, of course, as a masonry building. Everything on the exterior certainly makes it look like uh, it is a masonry bearing wall structure. It often gets called the tallest masonry skyscraper uh, in the world. If you look closely, though, you can see, first of all, that um, that masonry wall is really distilled into piers. And again, if you uh, reconstruct the Monadnox uh, structure from drawings from Burnham and Root's office, what you realize is that it is, again, a hybrid structure that there are, in fact, masonry shear walls that stay the building in the short direction. But on the north end, where Burnham and Root's clients wanted a more open floor plan, those masonry shear walls are substituted by what are called wind trusses, or portal frames between two steel columns that rise the entire height of the building. There's also steel work that forms the cantilevered bay windows. Root disguises these cantilevered bay windows by sort of making the, the masonry wall appear as if it is one continuous curtain. But in fact, the masonry on the bay windows is supported by these steel cantilevers, while the masonry in the piers next to it is actually structural. The Monadnock often claimed to be a masonry skyscraper. This analysis shows that it is really a kind of steel skyscraper, almost sort of trapped in an, a masonry skyscraper uh, and, and trying to get out, right? Bits of the old wind bracing technique in the masonry shear walls and the masonry piers, bits of the new steel wind bracing technique in the portal frames, uh, and particularly in the cantilevered uh, bay windows. The greatest example of uh, these uh, cross-braced or wind-braced buildings is the Masonic Temple built in 1892, briefly claimed as the world's tallest. And as you can see, it relied again on wind trusses strategically placed uh, to, to rise to its record-breaking height uh, of 22 stories. Now, the Masonic Temple was certainly a structural achievement uh, in, in, the, in its height. But if you look at the exterior, it had what the New York Times referred to as veneered construction. In other words, this is a, a sort of proto curtain wall, but it's a heavy curtain wall. It's a curtain wall that's still made out of masonry, right? Designed to uh, look reassuringly heavy, um, but also taking advantage of the economics of material at the time. Glass remained expensive through the 1890s uh, and masonry was a much cheaper material. So while the windows are large enough to bring in uh, plenty of daylight to the offices behind, the Masonic Temple still has plenty of brick uh, on the exterior. That would change with the discovery of natural gas in Indiana in the late 1880s, uh, and particularly the use of natural gas in the production of plate glass. The plate glass industry had been centered in Pittsburgh, which was convenient, more or less, to cities on the East Coast, but far away from Chicago. When this Trenton gas field is discovered in northeastern Indiana in the 1880s, uh, two entrepreneurs move from Pittsburgh. Uh, they set up shop in Kokomo, Indiana, and they begin producing plate glass using that gas field as fuel exclusively for the city of Chicago. Uh, their timing is really poor. The country enters a recession in 1892, uh, and they have this vast stockpile of plate glass uh, just an hour or two away from downtown Chicago uh, and implosively declining prices. Um, what you see then is the real flourishing of the glass curtain wall. Uh, here in 1895, in the depths of the Depression, when plate glass prices would have been at their cheapest, 
Burnham uh, and his uh, new partner, Atwood, uh, Root dies in 1891 of, of overwork. Uh, Atwood comes in, uh, and among the projects they design is the Reliance Building, uh, a, a speculative tower on the corner of Washington and State that is designed for suburban doctors to come downtown and, and see their patients in the loop uh, instead of out uh, in their suburban practices. This is a program, obviously, that needs as much daylight uh, as those doctors can possibly get. And Burnham and Atwood respond with a design that is something like 60% plate glass on the outside, taking advantage of this implosively priced uh, glass from Kokomo. You can see here the postcard. This building is nearly all doctor's offices. And you can see the difference between the very glassy facade of the Reliance, these huge double bay windows, uh, and the facades of the older buildings uh, to either side of it. The Reliance also pioneered the moment frame. E.C. Shankland, Burnham's engineer, here for the first time applies that principle of the very, very stiff riveted joint uh, to a full building frame. The Reliance has no shear walls. It has no cross bracing. All of its wind bracing comes from the stiff joints between its girders uh, and its columns. Uh, the next year, Burnham and Atwood collaborate on a sort of sister building to the Reliance, the Fisher Building. Uh, the Fisher Building, by a sort of quirk of its siting, uh, does not need a firewall on its one uh, neighboring side. The they buy essentially the air rights to this neighbor, and they can construct a lightweight uh, terracotta wall that ultimately, in fact, will be knocked down for an extension uh, in 1907. Um, because of this, the Fisher Building uh, very uniquely has uh, gotten rid of masonry in its uh, gravity structure, uses in t in a full steel skeleton for its, its gravity loads. Uh, it uses moment connections in that steel skeleton for its wind bracing, uh, and it uses nothing but terracotta and glass for its cladding. This led the Inland Architect in its coverage of the Fisher to claim that the Fisher building was in fact the first uh, tall building to be built, quote, literally without walls. And what Inland Architect means by this is that the Fisher building is built without brick. It uses a self-braced steel skeleton to hold it up, to keep it from falling over. It uses a lightweight terracotta and glass skin to keep the rain out. Uh, and it has avoided both the weight and the time and the kind of labor agitation that comes with having hundreds of bricklayers uh, all on your building site. This, of course, is something that clients love, contractors love, architects love, uh, but it's not something that bricklayers love. And by the time the Fisher goes up, uh, they have agitated and made their voices heard. They see that their jobs are on the line with these new techniques. And in 1893, they persuade the city of Chicago to change its building code. Uh, they require exterior walls of buildings permitted after the code goes into effect. Reliance and Fisher get permitted before the code goes into effect. So after the code goes into effect, all exterior walls, no matter what they're made of, are to be a minimum of 12 inches thick. The Bricklayers Union claims that this is for fireproofing reasons. They're not confident uh, that the terracotta, these, these thin terracotta jackets can do the job. They persuade the city council of this. Um, they require eight inches of thickness uh, if terracotta is used for fireproofing uh, on the interior. And they also restrict uh, bay windows so that more of the facade has to essentially be uh, be solid. Now, the dimensions of a common American brick are nominally four by eight inches. And so what the bricklayers have done with the Chicago Building Code is essentially legislate all of the advantages of terracotta uh, out and they have basically uh, legislated themselves back into work. Uh, there are no more advantages to terracotta uh, over brick and brick goes back to being a default, not necessarily for structure, uh, but for fireproofing. We can see the effects of this right away. Uh, the Chicago Stock Exchange, uh, now demolished and a much missed building by Adler and Sullivan in 1896, is one of the first buildings to be permitted under this new code. And if you look closely, you can see that the bay windows that Sullivan tries to get away with uh, are almost uh, too solid. Right? They have so little glass on them because of their restrictions that they're not very effective uh, in bringing in a lot of daylight. On the other hand, the flat surface uh, contains what would come to be known as the Chicago window. 
The Chicago window is essentially filling whatever is left after the bricklayers code amendments uh, have wrapped their way around the steel frame. You take whatever is left and you simply put in as large a window as you can. A fixed light in the middle to bring in daylight, double hung windows on either side that can be operated uh, to bring in uh, fresh air. This is the transitional building. This shows uh, an architect trying to do the bay windows that were legal under the old code, but finally sort of capitulating to the realities of the new code in those flat surfaces uh, and so-called Chicago windows. This is the formula that defines Carson Peary Scott, or originally Schlesinger and Meyer, Louis Sullivan's kind of great masterpiece of commercial architecture. The first phase done in 1899, the second phase with the corner done in 1902. All of it though, if you look at it, done basically as a way of simply ornamenting the code amendments that the bricklayers have put into action. The uh, main uh, components of uh, the Carson's building, once you get above Sullivan's beautiful ornament on the first and second floor, these are simply jacketed steel frames that are, with, that are then filled. Uh, once they're wrapped, they're filled with as much glass as Sullivan can get away with. And it is Sullivan's genius that sees how little ornamental touches can take the formula that he's been given by the building code and turn it into a work of architecture. Um, this is essentially, uh, this masterpiece of Chicago architecture is essentially Sullivan's ornamental genius at work on a building that has almost literally been designed by the Bricklayers Union. Now, that formula fades too. By 1911, we start to see this mercantile classicism creeping in, particularly in the work of Daniel Burnham. Here in 1911, two buildings done uh, right before his death, the People's Gas Building on the left and the Insurance Exchange Building on the right. Now, if you look at the construction photo of People's Gas, you can see that it's still a curtain wall building. But now instead of terracotta and glass, or instead of tightly jacketed frames and brick and large Chicago windows, we get this predominantly solid curtain wall. Burnham chooses to ornament it in this very, very heavy-handed classical style. It's no secret that Burnham was a great fan of classicism, but it doesn't really make sense in the narrative of the quote-unquote Chicago school. This is where a lot of historians kind of get off the bus, right? Throw their hands up and say, this is when Chicago lost its way. But I want to make the argument that even this generation of buildings is profoundly in touch with the technological developments of the time. It's not that Burnham gave up on the principles of the Chicago School. It's that the fundamental principle of the Chicago School that form followed this negotiation between function and technique was uh, adhered to as rigidly as it had been before. It's just that the variables had now changed. And in particular, what changed in 1910 was a, a vast improvement in illuminating technology. Electricity had been dropping in price throughout the 1880s, the 1890s, but it was the invention of the tungsten filament in 1910 that suddenly meant that light bulbs lasted for thousands of hours instead of hundreds of hours. And it no longer made that much of a difference if you turned the lights on during the day or let the sun do the work for you and conserved the, the, the life of the light bulb. Chicago is a, a city with very, very hot summers, very, very cold winters. All of these buildings I've shown you with these massive expanses of Indiana plate glass are single glazed. So those giant windows create greenhouses in Chicago's hot summers, and they create basically ice boxes in Chicago's cold winters. It made environmental sense once there was a better way to illuminate offices within, uh, once electricity and light bulbs were cheap enough, Chicago architects and builders started designing solid, better insulated facades with windows that were much, much smaller. Now, why design with windows at all? Well, a comparison of these two buildings' plans gives some hint at what was still going on. Here's People's Gas on the left, Insurance Exchange on the right. Now, both of these are electrically illuminated buildings, small windows, um, yet they both still have light courts in the center. Why would this be? Why would you sacrifice that much territory if you can illuminate uh, your interiors uh, electrically? 
Well, the key lies in the corridor in both plans. Here on the left, you can see that People's Gas adopts basically the, the interior racetrack corridor uh, that had been de rigueur since the, the rookery. There are offices on both sides of the corridor. Some of them look to the outside. Some of them look into the light court. Here, though, in the insurance exchange, the corridor is actually on the light court wall itself. And this makes no sense if you're thinking about trying to illuminate the office interiors with natural daylight. The rule of thumb had always been that you could go about 20 or 25 feet from a window and still benefit from natural daylight. Here, the clerical spaces in, in people's gas are just a little bit too far, but here the deep plan offices in the ex insurance exchange are up to 50 or 60 feet away from a window. So insurance exchange is absolutely being illuminated by electricity. The uh, other issue though, is that the light courts were also used for ventilation. And the rule of thumb there was that about a 60 foot distance between windows was all you could expect to naturally ventilate on a hot summer day. You would open up the windows on the light court, open up the windows on the exterior, open a transom window over the corridor door uh, and hope for a favorable breeze that would uh, kind of wash fresh air through hot offices uh, and uh, provide some measure of cooling, some measure of natural ventilation. Beginning in 1910, 1911, the light court really becomes an air court. And while the thickness of the floor plate stays the same, the depth of the offices can change. Here we have a floor plate that very clearly is electrically illuminated, but naturally ventilated. Now, this coincides with the greatest period of building in Chicago, the post-World War I boom in the 1920s. Um, that leads buildings, uh, developers to want to build taller and taller. There are new techniques, in particular pneumatic river, riveting, that enable both quicker construction uh, and stronger connections that allow taller and taller buildings. You may recognize that this cover of Scientific American is in fact not Chicago, it is in New York. And in fact, in 1914, it was on the tallest uh, office building in the country at the time, the Woolworth Building, uh, the tallest office building in the world, uh, finished in 1914, that used riveted steel frames using uh, pneumatic riveting tools to achieve a moment frame uh, and a height of well over 700 feet. This, in addition to uh, the developer's constant desire for more height, led to a good deal of agitation in Chicago. In addition to its restrictive fireproofing code, Chicago had had very, very strict height limits all the way back into the 1880s. The height limit hovered around 264 feet. It went up and down sometimes, uh, but generally uh, 260, 264 feet uh, was the limitation for height within the loop. In 1920, uh, that was expanded slightly. You could build what was called a spire up to about 400 feet. And then in 1923, after agitation by the Chicago Tribune, uh, in response to a, a spire on the Chicago Temple uh, in downtown that went on top of a, an office building sponsored by the Methodist Church that rose to 555 feet, um, the city council finally uh, stripped down its code and started again. They came up with a more progressive zoning legislation based on that of New York that kept the cornice height at 264 feet, but then allowed developers to build within uh, one to 10 setbacks. Architects responded with what were called block and tower schemes, literally a 264 foot block with a tower that fit within the cone above uh, or a setback scheme that literally followed the lines of those one in 10 slopes uh, all the way up to a point where uh, the, the returns would be diminishing, right? Where the floor plates would just get too small. In 1922, the Michigan Avenue Bridge opened, Wacker Drive opened, uh, and this new skyscraper neighborhood around the Michigan Bridge uh, crossing sprung up, and it shows very clearly the effects uh, of the new code. Uh, on all of these buildings, you can see the 264-foot cornice, and you can see various interpretations uh, of how that setback height uh, could be taken advantage of. The Jewelers Building, which is a classic block and tower, 333 North Michigan, which is a classic setback uh, or pylon scheme. In 
Now, the problem with this, though, was that the, the setback basically in a really, really big building meant that you could build tallest where previously you had wanted to put an air court. And so the generation of sort of so-called Art Deco skyscrapers in the 1920s and 1930s basically functions by taking the light court and turning it inside out. Instead of plans shaped like donuts, these are plans shaped like the letter H. The Opera Building, uh, One North LaSalle, and particularly the Board of Trade, all have their light courts basically turned inside out. And the greatest of these, the last uh, great skyscraper built uh, before the, the, uh, the shutdown that came from the Great Depression and World War II, uh, was the Field Building by Graham Anderson Probst and White, successor firm to Burnham, where you can imagine looking at the mid-rise plan here that literally they've taken uh, that courtyard that would typically be in the center uh, of, a, of, a, 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 of naturally ventilated building and flipped it around. So the field building consists of these four arms, uh, each of which is about 60 feet uh, wide. So just narrow enough to get natural ventilation uh, and each of them sort of facing into these inverted light courts, light courts turned uh, inside out. All of that so that Graham Anderson Probst and White could take advantage of the setback to build this slab in the center also about 60 feet, also naturally ventilated. Uh, but interestingly enough, sitting on a five-story base that literally built to the edges of the site that had no light court at all. And in fact, these lower five stories were the first commercial spaces uh, in Chicago, the first new commercial construction to take advantage of another formula changing technology. These five stories were all air conditioned. The windows were sealed. Uh, electricity, of course, provided the illumination throughout, uh, but now electricity also provided the, the conditioned air. Uh, air conditioning, which used refrigeration techniques to chill water, to chill air that was then pumped into the commercial spaces. And for the first time, we have a building mass uh, that can respond directly to the entire site that doesn't need to carve out space either for light uh, or for air. The field building also, um, if we go back for just a second, you can see that it uh, is a different interpretation of the solid skin that Burnham was experimenting with as early as 1911. Small double hung windows uh, where you need natural ventilation, uh, but the size of those windows now geared as much toward uh, view and the psychology of seeing out uh, as anything else. Now, interestingly, the sort of deep plan and the thin skin with small windows became the kind of standard when Chicago construction picked up again in the 1950s. Uh, the Prudential Building by Nason Murphy in 1954 was in many ways a continuation of the logic of the field building. Uh, a deep plan now, no need for natural ventilation, sealed windows, uh, and no need for a natural illumination either. Interestingly enough, vertical limestone uh, panels, just like on the field building, uh, but now windows that responded to technologies that came online uh, in the 1930s and 1940s during the sort of uh, interstitial years when there was no skyscraper construction going on in Chicago. Insulated glazing, patented in the late 1930s, commercially developed in the 1940s. The Prudential was the first Chicago building to really take advantage of that. And then another handful of technologies, uh, including heat absorbing glass, led to the all glass facades of, for instance, the Inland Steel Building uh, done in 1958. This is all the topic of current research, looking at uh, what changed between the 1930s and the 1950s, uh, how the formulas for skyscrapers developed, and how that uh, functional desire to stack as many floors as you can on top of one another legally and safely took advantage of all of these new technologies in the post-war era to achieve really the same functional ends that skyscrapers had for generations to, uh, aspired to uh, in the 19th century. Interestingly enough, uh, things come full circle in some ways. The two greatest towers of the post-war era in Chicago, the John Hancock and the Sears, um, use these two structural techniques, cross-bracing, uh, similar to William LeBaron Jenny's uh, Manhattan building, and Sears, funnily enough, a moment frame using moment connections pioneered by Shankland uh, in the Reliance to reach their record-breaking heights. And so even though the technology has changed, um, some of the same ideas come back uh, again and again.
Um, these ideas uh, to me show that architecture is not this kind of uh, artistic discipline that's cut off kind of from the, 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 the rest of the world. It's fundamentally engaged with issues of uh, technology, of materials, of engineering, uh, but also of finance and of course of, of civic presence. Uh, the codes that influenced the shape of the buildings in the 1920s or that influenced the, the kind of formula of the, the facades themselves uh, in the 1890s, codes are political documents and they reflect the desires of the politically powerful uh, entities in, in any city at any given time. That too continues uh, through the post-war era. Um, if these kind of stories are of, of interest to you in addition to uh, the, the book that came out uh, in 2013, um, there is an organization called the Construction History Society that uh, looks at questions like this, looks at the relationship between the sort of nuts and bolts of building uh, and the larger social and cultural forces uh, beyond them. Uh, and there is also my own uh, personal kind of research notebook, online research notebook, uh, a blog called Architecture Farm, uh, where we investigate a lot of these questions and, and I uh, post not only uh, answers to things, but also questions that, uh, that I'm looking at uh, from time to time. Um, I'll leave it there with these two guys uh, on the uh, skeleton frame of one North LaSalle, uh, reminding you that buildings not only are kind of objects that exist in the city, but they're also the result of all of these processes, financial, technological, uh, and of course, uh, very personal uh, when it comes to it comes to labor. People have actually built these. These forces have all uh, influenced the shape uh, and the form. But at the end of the day, uh, they've all been put together by people actually driving uh, the rivets uh, that make them stand up.